Thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, thank you very much to Dr. Salerno and Dr. Thornton for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today about a topic uh, that a growing number of modern economists is interested in or concerned with these days, namely inequality. Uh, who of you has heard about uh, Thomas Piketty and his book, Capital in the 21st Century? So you all know this book has been a great success. Everybody has bought it. And supposedly, everybody has read it. <laughs> and everybody who has talked about this book in public praised it. Uh, from the American president to the pope, everybody loves this book. Um, but thanks to Kindle statistics, we now know that only a very small fraction of readers has, has actually ventured beyond page 27. <laughs> okay. out, of, out of 700 pages. So they have basically read the introduction, not the whole book. But that's really not what is important. What is important is that they are all very concerned with the issue that is raised in the book, and that is increasing inequality in terms of income and wealth, over the past 50 years, okay? Um, and in my opinion, uh, this is a topic, a research topic that Austrian economists in particular are very suited to, to make contributions to because many of modern day Austrians have specialized uh, in the field of economics that one of the main causes of this phenomenon falls into, namely monetary economics. And today in this lecture, I want to talk about the causal relationship between monetary policy and inequality. Okay, so as a start, I want to give you two papers as suggested readings. The first one is a short paper by Guido Hülsmann, published in a book edited by Dr. Salerno and uh, Dr. Howden uh, in 2014. It was published. The title of the book is The Fed at 100. So the book is published by Springer in, and accordingly is very expensive. So I recommend to look for the, uh, for the working paper version of this paper, which is uh, available for free online. Okay, the second paper that I recommend to all those who are interested in, in this topic is, is a working paper by two economists from the University of Leipzig in Germany, uh, Pablo Duarte and Gunter Schnabel. They have recently, in 2017, published a working paper that um, deals with these issues. Uh, and this is also available for free online. Uh, so most of the ideas that I'm going to present today are from those two papers. Okay, uh, the lecture plan is as follows. So we will start with uh, some empirical analysis. So we will just look at uh, different measures of inequality and how they have developed over time in the past 60 years. So we will look at income, we will look at wealth. We will look at sector inequality. In particular, we will look at the financial sector and manufacturing. <laughs> and we will look at intergenerational inequality, specifically uh, at the inequality between young and old generations. And in the next part of the lecture, we're going to do the theoretical explanation for this phenomenon. So we will talk about the role or the impact of monetary policy. Here we will first of all talk about monetary expansion. That's what monetary policy is all about. And it's um, most uh, immediate effect price inflation. Then we will uh, again reiterate and explain uh, the notion of Cantillon effects that has already been mentioned this week. And we will talk about monetary expansion when it occurs in the form of credit expansion specifically. And if we have time, we might have a conclusion at the end. <laughs> okay, so first part, empirical analysis. First, we have to define our terms. First type of inequality that is often looked at in the empirical research is income inequality. So what is income? A very broad and general definition of income is this one here. Uh, income is just a gain in the ability to consume or save uh, over a specified period of time. What is important here is the last part, over a specified uh, period of time. So income is what economists call a flow variable. Uh, we can measure income only with, res with respect to a certain period of time. And we cannot measure it for one point in time specifically. But of course, for empirical research, this uh, definition is too broad. 
Uh, so one of the main drawbacks of empirical research, we always have to narrow down our definitions to something that is measurable. So a measurable definition of income is, of course, monetary income. So we will look at monetary income defined as the sum of money received over a specified period of time. And this period of time is usually a year. So we will look at annual income. And this includes wages, which is the income from labor. It includes interest, which is income from capital. It includes rents, which is income from land. And what's the last one? Profits. Profits. Income from entrepreneurship or from, from uncertainty bearing. Um, so this is the classical taxonomy of income uh, according to the different sources. But of course, we have to add gifts and inheritance. That's also a source of income. It's of particular importance in developed countries like the US. Okay, so the next type of inequality is inequality with respect to wealth, wealth inequality. And wealth is a very different uh, variable. It can again generally define just as all the tangible and intangible things that make an individual, a group, a family, or a nation, some collective, whatever, better off. Okay, that's again much too broad. A slightly more narrow version, uh, narrow definition is the amount uh, of saved income at a given moment in time. Okay, and here you see one difference between the two variables. Wealth is a stock variable, as economists call it, because we can measure wealth at any given moment in time. Uh, we don't have to have a, a, a reference period. Uh, <clears throat> so, but again, this is uh, not narrow enough. Of course, we will look in empirical research at economic wealth, which is defined as the monetary exchange value of all the owned assets, capital goods, and long-term consumer goods of an individual or a group in society. And those assets include financial assets, bonds, stocks, cash deposits, etc. And it includes uh, non-financial assets such as real estate, land, commodities, precious metals, you name it. Okay, um, now how do we measure inequality? Well, total income or total wealth are somehow distributed among the population. And what we do is we rank our population from the top income receivers or top wealth holders to the bottom income receivers or wealth holders. Okay, so we have a population. 10 individuals, and we rank them from number one to down to the last one in the ranking. Okay, so we have here in our little example 10 individuals that constitute the population. The one in the front is the top 10% of the income distribution, let's say. And the poor guy at the end is the bottom 10% of the income distribution. He's so poor there wasn't even enough color to paint him all over. <laughs> Okay, uh, and now what we do is, in order to get an idea of how in unequal the distribution is, we calculate total income for the whole population. Okay, let's say this population receives five million dollars per year, and then we look at the income of different segments of the distribution. For example, let's say that the guy at the end, the bottom 10%, receives 50,000 US dollars per year, now we can calculate the income share, which corresponds to 1%. Okay, the calculation is very simple. It's $50,000 divided by total income. It's 1%. We can do the same, for example, for the top 10%. Let's say the top 10% earn 2 million US dollars. That would mean that their income share is 40%. Okay, so the top 10% of the income distribution here receive 40% of total income. The calculation is, uh, is identical. It's the income of the segment divided by total income. Of course, we do not only look at bottom 10% and top 10%. We look at, as I said, different segments. One very important segment that is often looked at is the bottom 50%. So the lower half of the income distribution. How much do they earn? What is their income share? What is their wealth share? Um, or we often look at the middle 40% which are the 40% in the distribution that separate the bottom 50 and the top 10. So the middle 40% is what is often referred to as the middle class. 
Okay, they are in the upper half of the income distribution, but not quite the most, not quite the richest in society. <clears throat> okay, so now let's look at some real data for the US. Okay, here we have uh, the income shares uh, for the top 1% and the bottom 50% in the US from 1970 to uh, 2014. This is basically the signature chart for the Occupy Wall Street movement. Okay, we see that the income share of the top 1% has almost doubled in that period from roughly 10% to almost 20%, while the income share of the bottom 50% in red has fallen accordingly. Okay, so we see here that over time inequality in terms of income has increased. Uh, this figure is very interesting, but I find this one even more intriguing. Okay, here we have the top 10% plotted against the bottom 60%. Uh, and when I saw this, I was playing with the data. That's what you do when you have some data. You play around, see what looks best. <laughs> and, and, and I saw this and I was intrigued. The symmetry is astonishing, right? I mean, the, the share that is gained by the top 10% is exactly the share that is lost by the bottom 60%. And, and I, it, I had an association when I saw this. Does it remind you of anything? Yes, it's, it's, the scissor, it's the scissors of inequality cutting through society. Yeah. Okay, here's another one. Um, here we have, again, the top 10%, this time plotted against the middle 40. So the middle 40, as I said earlier, are still part of the upper half of the income distribution, but their income share has decreased, okay? So also here uh, we see that inequality in terms of income seems to have increased. And now let's look at some wealth data. This is the plot for exactly the same segments of the distribution as the first one we saw for income. This time for wealth, we have um, the top 1% plotted against the bottom 50%. And we see the two shares are much further apart than the two shares we saw earlier for income. So that we see directly that inequality is much bigger in terms of wealth than it is in terms of income. Okay, and we see again that while uh, the wealth share for the top 1% has decreased initially in the late 60s and early 70s, it starts to increase since the early 80s or end of the 70s. Okay, so here also inequality has increased. This is another uh, plot. Uh, here we have the top 1% plotted against the middle 40%, okay? So again, earlier we, for income, we have seen the top 10% plotted against the middle 40, and it was roughly in the same range. This time we can take the top 1%, which is only a subgroup of the top 10%, and it is in the same range. So again, inequality in terms of wealth is stronger than it is in terms of income. Okay, another interesting um, variable that is often looked at is the wealth to income ratio. Okay, so here we take total wealth and divide it by total income. Let's see how this has developed over time. We see that in the, in the 1970s it was below 400%, meaning that total wealth was less than four times total annual income. And uh, since then it has increased. Of course, we can see uh, the impact of the dot-com bubble, for example. This is one peak over there we see the impact of uh, the housing bubble, okay? Of course, they have aggravated or amplified the phenomenon quite a bit, but what is interesting in the plot is still like the general positive trend of this development. The wealth to income ratio has increased, and this is an indicator for a diminished upward social mobility. Okay, given, given a certain level of income, it becomes relatively more difficult to attain a relative level of wealth. It takes more years of uh, income to uh, attain a certain level of wealth. So that's an interesting development. <clears throat> now, an important question is, of course, uh, what are the relevant segments? Is there any way to, to aggregate inequality? Can we reduce it to one number, ideally? And yes, uh, one proposition has been the Gini coefficient. Who of you has heard about the Gini coefficient? 
Who of you is able to define it? <laughs> okay, I will, I will try to explain that very briefly. It's a bit technical, but um, yeah, just interrupt me if it's too boring. Okay. So the Gini coefficient is, is uh, defined uh, graphically. Okay, we have a diagram here. And on the x-axis, I want you to imagine that we have the cumulated share of the rank ordered population. Okay, so 0.1 corresponds to the bottom 10%, 0.2 to the bottom 20%, 0.3 to the bottom 30%, etc. One over there corresponds to the entire population. On the other axis, we have the income share. Okay, and now the entire distribution in terms of income, this, uh, in this example in terms of income, uh, can be represented by one curve, which is called the Lorentz curve. And in the hypothetical world of perfect equality, the curve is actually a straight line. It's exactly the 45 degree line. Okay, that means that, for example, the bottom 50% earn exactly 50% of total income. The bottom 60% earn exactly 60%. That means that everybody in the population receives the same amount of money every year. Okay, this is not how it looks like in reality, but this is the benchmark case, okay? This is the case where the Gini coefficient is zero. Zero inequality. Uh, in practice, when we have some empirical distribution, uh, the curve looks very different. It, it always starts here at the origin, at the point zero, zero, because the bottom zero percent receive 0% of total income, that's clear. And it always ends on top there at the point 0.11. Uh, the total population put together receives 100% of total income. But the curve is always somewhere below the perfect equality line. Okay, and it is convex like this. Okay, it is below the perfect equality line because, for example, the bottom 50% of the population can never receive more than 50% of total income because if that was the case, they wouldn't be the bottom 50%. Okay, so it has to be below the perfect equality line and it has to be convex because we have a rank order here. Uh, the, the relative income share or the income share of the segments increases as we go along, along the x-axis. All right, so let's now take a simple example. Let's. Think, uh, let's think about a two-class society. Okay, we have the bottom 90% that receives 10% of total income. Accordingly, the upper 10%, the top 10% receive the rest of income, 90% of total income. And within those two classes, income is evenly distributed. That's why the curve for those two segments is a straight line. Okay, now the Gini coefficient is simply defined in terms of the surface area between the benchmark case of perfect equality and the actual distribution that we observe. Okay, let's say the surface area is A, the Gini coefficient is then formally defined as twice A. Okay, I spare you the math, but in that case, the Gini coefficient is 0 0.8. Okay, if you have a distribution that is closer to the perfect equality line, the Gini coefficient becomes accordingly smaller. In this case, it would be 0.8. Six, and in the most extreme case of perfect inequality, where nobody receives any income except one guy at the end who receives it all, we have a Gini coefficient of one. Yeah, that's the maximum value for the Gini coefficient. And in practice, we always observe uh, some uh, value between zero and one. The closer it is to one, the more inequality we have. Okay, so let's look at the Gini coefficient in terms of income and wealth in the US. Here we have the Gini coefficient in terms of income, and we see that it has increased um, quite a bit since the early 1970s. Okay, initially it looks as if it has fallen. In the early 1970s, it starts rising. You know what happened in the 1970s? Stagflation. Yeah. Yeah, that was the Nixon shock in 71. So it was basically the introduction of a global fiat money system. Okay, and, and Piketty in his book points that out and says, oh, since the early 1970s, inequality seems to skyrocket. I wonder what happened there. <laughs> uh, he doesn't elaborate on it at all, but he just 
sees it, okay, it's in the early 1970s that it starts. Okay, if we look at the Gini coefficient for wealth, it's a bit more complicated, it's not as clear cut, okay? We see, first of all, that the Gini coefficient is much higher to begin with than it was for income. So it is um, somewhere below 0 0.85 initially in the 1960s, then it goes down and it starts to increase only in the, in the 1980s. And of course, um, we have again this bump over there which nicely coincides with the most recent financial crisis or the housing bubble or the Great Recession, as it is called. And if you accept the Austrian business cycle theory well, that identifies a root cause of business cycles in monetary policy, well, as explained earlier today by Roger Garrison, um, then it's not actually a big step to assume that there might also be a relationship between monetary policy and this phenomenon that we observe over there, namely increased inequality in terms of wealth. Okay, we have other types of inequality that we can briefly look at. For example, we have sector inequality, okay? Um, we can ask ourselves, how does the income, or in particular, how do wages develop over time in different sectors of the economy. And I have looked uh, specifically at the financial industry and manufacturing. Uh, other possibilities would be to look at the public sector versus the private sector. My working hypothesis would be that wage developments in the public sector are much better than they are in the private sector, but I might be wrong. <laughs> so this is an interesting graph. Um, from the paper by uh, Duarte and Schnabel, plotting um, the percentage change of real wages in the financial industry and in manufacturing um, from 1965 uh, <coughs> onwards. Um, and what we see is that initially in the 1970s, um, wages, real wages in the financial industry decreased more sharply. It looks as if the great inflation that occurred in the 1970s was more harmful for wages in the financial sector. That's, that's their rationale in the paper. I'm not sure whether that's the actual and the, the, the right explanation for this. Um, but we see that wages uh, in both sectors have decreased. And then in the 1980s, they start to increase again. And wages in the financial sector increase uh, more than wages in manufacturing. In fact, since the 1980s, the percentage change of real wages in the financial industry is always higher than in manufacturing, and it's almost never negative. There's one exception over here. Okay? Uh, real uh, wage growth in manufacturing is often negative in this period, since the 1980s. Um, of particular interest, again, is this period of the Great Recession, um, where we see that percentage change of real wages in manufacturing is much more severe. Huh? The fall in, in, in wages is much stronger for the manufacturing sector than it is for the financial industry, which is surprising when you think about that the Great Recession started out as a financial crisis, huh? as a crisis in the financial industry. You would assume that wages there fall more sharply than in in other sectors of the economy. Uh, again, my working hypothesis here is that it has to do with bailout programs. Okay, I have another type of inequality for you that might be of particular interest for you because it is about intergenerational inequality. So inequality between different age groups in the population. Okay, we will look at the medium income of different wage groups and how they have developed over time. It is important to note at this point that this is not an absolute comparison. It is quite normal that there are differences in terms of wages between young and older generations. That's, that's very natural because older generations have more working experience, okay? So the fact that Peter Klein earns a bit more money than I do <laughs> is probably justified. Okay. Just age. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what we do is we, we look at index numbers, okay? We have a base year, and then we look at the relative developments of the medium wage in those different age groups, and here they are. Okay, we have four age groups, 
uh, age uh, 15 to 24, 25 to 34, 45 to 54, 55 to 64. Um, the older generations are in gray, the younger generations are in black. Okay, so since 1979, which is the base year, uh, medium uh, wages, which are here deflated by the consumer price index, so it's, it's uh, the medium real wage, median real wage, um, has declined for all age groups. And then uh, divergence occurs in the early 1980s, okay? The, the wages, the median wage for the older generations increases. The median wage for the younger generations uh, keeps decreasing. So at the end uh, of the period that we are looking at here, we have a nice spread between uh, younger and older generations. I mean, nice depends on your perspective. But um, if there was no change in terms of the relative inequality between the age groups, then all of the four time series would have, uh, have the same path. Okay? The fact that they don't have the same path indicates that inequality, no matter what it was at the beginning, we don't know, but that inequality has increased between the age groups. Okay? And uh, obviously the youngest generation, 15 to 24 year olds, uh, for them the, uh, the wage development has been the worst. Uh, again, uh, the Great Recession. Okay? If you look at only what happened after the Great Recession or during the Great Recession, you see that the decline in the median wage for the youngest generation is uh, the strongest. Okay, and in this graphical representation, if the relative change in the median wage was the same for every age group, then actually the graphical representation for the top time series, for the oldest graph, the, the decrease should be the strongest, well, because we are looking at this in relative terms. But um, not very important now. That's another graph where we have to tame the same time series, the same median wage for the different age groups, and this time we deflate it by housing prices. That's very interesting for young generations because young people usually don't have houses yet and might want to acquire one in the future. And we see that uh, the wages deflated by housing prices for young generations have really declined quite severely. And again, of course, we have the impact of the housing bubble. At the peak of the housing bubble, the index for the youngest was down to 50. Okay, So uh, a house of the same quality has become 50% more expensive if you like. There was a slight correction in housing prices, obviously, after the bubble burst, but still the overall trend is visible. It's not a big problem for all those who already possess houses. Okay, when house, housing prices go up, it's good for house owners. When housing prices go up, it's very bad for those who might want to buy a house and have not done uh, so yet. Okay, so now let's summarize the empirical results. The MP available empirical data suggests that there has been an increase in income inequality, in wealth inequality, an increase in the wealth to income ratio, which indicates there is, that there is a diminished upward social mobility. And um, there has been an increase in sector income inequality, specifically for the financial sector and manufacturing, as compared to manufacturing, and an increase in intergenerational inequality looks as if older generations have had much more favorable wage developments than younger generations. Um, now, we want to explain this phenomenon in terms of monetary policy, and at this point I want to give you a little disclaimer here. I do not argue that monetary policy is the only cause uh, for this uh, phenomenon. No, there, is, there are many other causes that, uh, that play a role, but we isolate the impact of monetary policy in this lecture. Carl, before you go into the theory section, I just, I just one clarifying, ask clarifying question. Yes. Uh, all of the measures that we've discussed so far are static measures in the sense that they look at a snapshot of how things are in one time and they compare them to a snapshot of how things are at some other time. I've also seen some studies that look at, you know, mobility, like what's the likelihood that a person who is in the bottom quintile oh, yeah, in this I mean, period, it moves into another quintile later, or the likelihood that you will be in a different 
wealth quintile from your parents. Yes. Is there any way to summarize that concisely? And what? Does well, that yeah, I mean, the, the, the relevant work on that topic has been done by Thomas Sowell. Right? Thomas Sowell has shown that, of course, there is some um, uh, change in what income bracket you are at any given moment in your life. You might, be, you might start off at the bottom, but uh, might work your way up to the top. That's certainly possible, but that's a very different question. Right, and the question is, is there any evidence that the, the, the degree of mobility has changed over time? Uh, yeah, uh, that I'm not aware of, okay. that I'm not aware of. Okay, if I do not manage to finish my lecture in time, it's his fault. Right. <laughs> I gotta do something to earn that high pay. <laughs> okay, so theory. Uh, let's talk about the impact of monetary policy. Again, we have to define our terms. What is monetary policy? And here I give you a very general and broad definition of monetary policy. It refers to all the actions of central banks and similar public and uh, semi-public institutions that are in control of the printing press. Hence, all the institutions in the economy that are involved in the production of fiat money. Oh, that's a suitable definition for the financial system that we live in. So, as I said, it's a broad notion of monetary policy. It includes central banks, of course, but it also includes commercial banks because, as was explained yesterday by Robert Murphy, in a fractional reserve banking system, commercial banks are also involved in the production of fiat money. Um, and in essence, what we are talking about is simply the expansion of the money supply, okay? We have a fiat money system because this renders the production of money much more, easily, much more easy. So in essence, when we talk about monetary policy, we talk about the expansion of the money supply and we want to analyze the effect of that, okay? First of all, again, a little graph just to illustrate the fact that the money stock in the economy has actually increased over the past decades. So here you have the money supply or money stock M1 for the US from 1960 to 2018. And yes, there was quite a bit of an increase. Um, from 1960 to 2017, the money stock M1 has multiplied by a factor of 25. Okay, this corresponds to an annual growth rate of 5.8%. But the most interesting segment is, of course, this one here at the end. Um, for this segment alone, from 2008 to 2017, the money stock has multiplied by 2.4, which corresponds to an annual growth rate of 11.8%. So uh, the Expansion of the money stock has accelerated. Of course, this is justified by the Great Recession and so on and so forth. You all know the story, but it's still interesting just to look at what the development was. Okay, uh, the most immediate effect, the most direct effect of monetary expansion is, of course, price inflation. Okay, this means that ceteris paribus, money prices for goods and services will be higher than before. Of course, in reality, the ceteris paribus clause never holds, so there are offsetting effects. And when the offsetting effects are strong enough, such as economic growth, real economic growth, um, then we might not actually observe price inflation, increasing prices for goods and services, even though there might have been monetary expansion. Mm -hmm. okay. So, so uh, Guido Hülsmann talked about this in his lecture yesterday about price inflation. <coughs> okay, but luckily, uh, monetary expansion for our purposes was strong enough and we have really observed price inflation. So one dollar in June uh, 2018 has the purchasing power of something in August 1971. What do you think it is? Fifteen cents is pretty good. It's 16, 16 cents. Huh? If you want to go even further back in history, uh, the year that the Federal Reserve was founded, it's 4%, okay? So uh, the US dollar has lost 84% of its purchasing power since 1971, and 96% since 1930. It's quite impressive. So since 1971, the average annual price inflation rate was around 4%. 
And this, of course, includes the, the great uh, stagflation, the great inflation of the 1970s. Uh, in later decades, the price inflation rate was a bit more moderate. But, uh, of course, as most of you know, modern central banks explicitly aim at having a positive price inflation rate. Okay? They have defined price stability as being a price inflation rate, an annual price inflation rate of around 2%. That's the policy goal. So it's the explicit goal of monetary policy to create an environment where the purchasing power of money constantly decreases. And this has, of course, uh, implications. How do people save in such an environment? Well, you don't leave uh, your money or your savings in cash under the pillow in your bed. And not for the purpose of saving. There might be other good reasons to hold some cash at home, but not for saving. Huh? You, you would be a moron to do that. So price inflation uh, discourages money hoarding. Again, something that uh, Guido Hülsmann has talked about yesterday. That's very important. It discourages money hoarding. And it's important to note that money hoarding is, of course, the easiest way to save. And historically, it's the preferred way of saving of low-income groups. And they prefer to save part of their income in cash because it's so easy. It does not require any expert knowledge about financial markets and different asset classes, uh, classes and investment strategies. You can just do it. You know, your grandma can do it. It's very easy. Um, but you are discouraged to do it. What instead you do is you redirect your savings into... Uh, asset and financial markets. Okay, so this implies, of course, an increased demand uh, for financial assets, for stocks, bonds, derivatives, etc. And this, in turn, entails a growth of, of the financial sector from the demand side. Okay, th this, in part, explains uh, the increased inequality in terms of different sectors when we look at the financial sector as compared to other sectors of the economy. And there's an increased demand for real assets or non-financial assets, such as real estate, right? So part of the housing bubble and increased uh, real estate prices in general is explained by the uh, price inflationary environment that central banks and other financial institution, institutions have created. <coughs> so what this means is that Generally, when we have a price inflationary environment where all prices and wages uh, increase over time, money loses its purchasing power, um, we have a disproportionate asset price inflation. If we only look at asset prices, they tend to increase faster than other prices because a price inflationary environment creates incentives for savers to go into financial and asset markets to redirect their savings into those markets. And this, of course, is a main driver of the wealth-to-income ratio. This explains, in part, why the wealth-to-income ratio has increased over time and why upward social mobility uh, has, has decreased. Okay? Asset price inflation is, again, good for everyone who owns assets already. It's bad for all those who don't have assets yet but want to acquire them. All right, so here's a, a plot that illustrates this claim very nicely. We have here share prices or stock prices and the consumer price index plotted against each other since 1960. Okay, we see that in the 1980s uh, the divergence occurs where the stock prices go up much faster than the consumer prices and this just um, yeah, illustrates this theoretical claim very nicely. Okay, I've uh, prepared a nice quote for you um, that explains uh, the problem of, uh, of price inflation when it comes to inequality. Here it is. Okay, I, I want you to guess who has written this. And Louis Rouenet is not allowed to speak. <laughs> okay, so, but when inflation remains high for a considerable period of time, investors will try to protect themselves by investing in real assets. There's every reason to believe that the largest fortunes are often those that are best indexed and most diversified over the long run. 
while smaller fortunes, typically checking or savings accounts, are the most seriously affected by inflation. Who is the great Austro-Libertarian thinker who said this? Right, Piketty. It's Thomas Piketty. As you can see, I ventured beyond page 27. <laughs> so I read the whole book, and this is the best part of it. Yeah? So you don't have to read it, actually. This is, this is the best part. Piketty does not develop this idea further, but he is obviously right. For once. <laughs> okay. Um, here again is another interesting uh, correlation, very interesting plot. We have the New York Stock Exchange Index plotted against the top 1% income share in the US. Okay, Every social scientist, every empirical social scientist who finds something like this uh, should be jumping for joy. Yeah? This is a correlation uh, that is pretty strong, um, yet not many people are talking about it. Okay, now we uh, come to uh, Cantillon effects. Uh, we make that very quickly. It's named after Richard Cantillon. The relevant work is this one. This is the cover of the book that is downstairs in the bookstore. If you have not yet bought your copy, do it after the lecture. Um, so Cantillon effects refer to the redistributive effects of money production or money creation. This is most likely how Richard Cantillon looks like, but we are not sure about this. Nobody knows for sure. This is Mark Thornton's theory. You should ask him about this. So the general idea is, of course, that uh, money is not given equally uh, to every participant in the economy. If that was the case, then inequality would diminish over time as uh, money supply expands. Nor is it the case that uh, newly created money is given an exact proportion to the existing income distribution. If that was the case, then the absolute inequalities would be amplified, but in relative terms, the inequalities would remain the same. Okay, uh, So it's always the case that some actors in the economy receive a disproportionate share of the, of the money earlier uh, than others. Uh, so the general idea of Cantillon effects <coughs> is that first receivers of the newly created money are benefited at the expense of late receivers. Somewhere in the economy, the new money enters. Some, uh, some people, a group of people, receives the new money and gets to spend the new money at still relatively low prices. Then the money ripples through the economy, gradually bids up prices. Those who in this process receive a share of the new money last or late are disadvantaged. Okay. Um, now, can we use this for our analysis of monetary expansion? Yes, if we think about what is often called the transmission mechanism, um, how does the new money actually enter the economy? So we look at monetary expansion as credit expansion, okay? Money enters the economy always in the form of credit. And does this have any structural effects? My answer is yes. So first of all, it's, of course, great for commercial banks who are the institutions that grant the credit to businesses, private individuals, or public institutions. Okay, so their, they, uh, their revenue is increased. Okay, <clears throat> so this, uh, the fact that the new money enters the economy in the form of credit granted by commercial banks entails, again, an increase of the financial sector from the demand and the supply side. Okay, so this explains partly the sector inequality we observed. We observed, <clears throat> and now if we go further and, and take the position of a commercial banker who is about to grant a credit, uh, the question that you have to ask is who will receive the credit? Uh, who are after the commercial banks, the individuals or institutions that receive the new money in the form of credit? Well, that's relatively easy to answer from the perspective of a commercial banker. If he has a choice, he will give it always to someone who is relatively well off, who already earns or receives a stable stream of income and who already possesses wealth that he or she uh, could use as collateral in the credit transaction. So this means that the haves are benefited at the expense of the have-nots or the have-not-yets, in particular the young people. So this experience part of the intergenerational inequality. And in general, 
this uh, mechanism tends to widen the gap between rich and poor. I have another quote here, and this is not Piketty, but in fact uh, an Austro-Libertarian thinker who um, corrects uh, yeah, an important uh, misconception. Because a lot of people think that the sheep credit benefits poor people or people who are relatively relatively poor. Uh, but this is not the case. Cheap credit always has disproportionately benefited rich businessmen such as the Donald Trumps and the Robert Maxwells of this world. And this is of course from uh, Rothbard's 1992 essay, Repudiating the National Debt. And I'll stop here and I'm available to answer any questions later today in my office.